Madam Chairperson. Uh, uh, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to uh, be here uh, to talk about such a uh, timely and pertinent and at the same time very, very difficult and involved issue that is uh, the issue of social justice, particularly in uh, a time of social and political turmoil. When you have that environment, the coordinates are very different, and you've got to really have your campus uh, well uh, ahead of you. And uh, I hope I will convey some of that to you based on my experience as a minister for 18 months. I see 18 months, but the, the equivalent uh, of 18 years in terms of stress and strain. That's true, I'm not exaggerating at all. And uh, I will uh, indicate how. Now, I uh, titled my uh, <coughs> presentation, Social Justice Lessons of Experience for Egypt. Now, means that lessons of experience for Egypt from Egypt's own experience and from the experience of other countries uh, in the world. <coughs> Uh, the main points that I will be covering is introduction, chronology of events, meaning of social justice, indicators of social justice. It means how social, socially unjust uh, the Egyptian society was, and still is actually. Uh, change was still marginal. Uh, factors behind rising social justice and measures taken, uh, or should be taken, uh, lessons of experience, and uh, I raise the question, did we have any break with the past uh, so far? And the answer is no. We didn't have a real break with the past. And uh, I, I hope I will convince you of that. Uh, now, I try to follow what uh, uh, the con conference organizers uh, sent us in terms of what every speaker should cover. And uh, as you know, this former slogan, Al Midan, Tahrir Square, was bread, freedom, social justice. So from day one, social justice was up uh, and flying in the agenda of, uh, of Egypt. Um, uh, of course, the background of that were, was two uh, uh, types of shocks. The, are, are we getting that? Yeah. The internal shocks uh, and the external shocks. The external shocks were caused first by the food crisis and then by the global financial crisis. And the two crises impacted very severely in Egypt, Egypt being a food insecure nation because it imports uh, at least 50% of its food. Uh, it, it was, and I think uh, still uh, so, but to a lower extent. As a result, of the growth of the Egyptian economy plunged significantly from over 6% uh, to only 2%. And, uh, uh, the, the, the country has to grapple with conflicting approaches to addressing uh, inclusive, pressure for inclusive uh, growth uh, and to meet the demands for social justice uh, against the backdrop of daily demands. Uh, very noisy demands at time, quieter at time, but nevertheless very uh, strong demands for social justice. Um, uh, in Egypt, <coughs> uh, in the lead up to uh, the January 25th, uh, there were several public protests, mainly most uh, wage related. And after the, uh, the January 25th, the actually uh, protests escalated. So if we just take the numbers, in the second half of 2012, there were about 500 such protests in various parts of the country. Uh, and, and in 2013, we had 1,200. And uh, this compares with only 176 in uh, 2010. And if there's any indication of anything, it's indication of the, uh, how important social justice is, and also the fact that uh, people have dropped the fear factor and so they resorted to the voice option. Uh, prior to that, they would have the, the exit option, either the recoil internally or they find somewhere else outside the country. 
but uh, increasingly after January 25th, the voice option is with us and it will have ramifications. The chronology events I'm not going to stop at, uh, most of us know, and uh, we may refer to them, but I would like to uh, uh, stop at the uh, June 20, uh, 30th, 12, 12, 2013, uh, which I call, people here sometimes call it the second revolution. The first was uh, January 25th, but of course it doesn't make sense uh, for any country uh, on our planet to have a revolution every couple of years. So, the, in fact, the revolution is an ongoing process. First wave, a big one, was back in January 25th. The second wa wave uh, came around in June 30th, 2013. And personally, I'm expecting a third one. When is going to happen? How vast and intense is going to be? But this is my uh, humble judgment. Uh, we are in for a third wave uh, of the revolution. Okay. <clears throat> uh, now, about the meaning of social justice. What does it mean? Well, in essence, social justice is equality, solidarity, and respect of human rights and dignity. So it's an all-encompassing concept. Uh, and I would like to stress that it does have three dimensions. Three dimensions. Uh, the first is horizontal, the second is vertical, and the third is spatial. Manifests itself in space. Now, how does that work? The horizontal dimension is the one we actually uh, talk about more. It's intergenerations, justice among uh, social groups that live together at the same time. Uh, the vertical dimension, which is often neglected, uh, addresses the intergenerational aspect of social justice. That means between the current generation and uh, future generations. And that's especially important dimension in a country that uh, relies heavily on extracting natural resources. We know natural resources are mainly depletable and if you uh, uh, extract more today, there will be less of them tomorrow for the next generation. Uh, also re re relevant here is job opportunities, education, and health. Anyway, the special dimension uh, is very important. And again, in Egypt's case, uh, you know, in many countries you get the uh, north-south thing. In Egypt, it's no different, uh, perhaps more intense. Uh, upper Egypt uh, uh, is, uh, and frontier governorates, uh, are neg hi highly neglected and uh, also rural compared to uh, urban. So that uh, uh, addresses the, um, the special. Uh, the, I want to say that the three dimensions are interrelated. They feed, uh, you address one uh, effectively, the other one is uh, addressed as well. But the intergenerational dimension is often neglected in public discourse. And you remember the who took to the streets first, both in Tunisia and in Egypt, were the uh, youth uh, part of society. Uh, <clears throat> now, social justice in this sense uh, is the cornerstone of the now term that has become quite uh, obvious, equitable development or inclusive development, social solidarity and uh, <coughs> Uh, solidarity, social and solidarity economy. Now, uh, what are the indicators of social injustice? How unjust was or unjust uh, Egypt was before uh, January 25th? We'll take some indicators. Uh, we take the distribution of income between wage and uh, non wage, like uh, let's say property income. Uh, wage income was close to 70% back in the 60s and early 70s of the last century. And, uh, and now I think it's closer to 30%, which means that there has been a significant drop in the share of wages in GDP. Unemployment kept rising. Uh, it, uh, it was about 9% at the start of the revolution. Now it's closer to 13%. And uh, we man did not manage to arrest that, so it, uh, we should expect it to rise for some time. Uh, but more important than the overall unemployment is youth unemployment, which is in Egypt is about 30%. That's political dynamite considering uh, the energy uh, and the uh, uh, fear free that the youth uh, enjoy. And they're they not they're prepared to uh, actually stir trouble 
uh, if you like the term. Okay. Now, poverty, uh, measured by the World Bank, one dollar a day, rose from 42% in 2009 to about 50% uh, now. There is a margin of error there, but uh, we are not really far off the mark. About two-thirds of the poor live in rural areas, especially in Upper Egypt. Take one governor, governor Asyut, which is in like uh, the southern part of the country. Uh, the unemployment rate, sorry, the uh, poverty rate there uh, is 58% strong, okay? Uh, mind you, these places are the hotbed for the uh, uh, Islamist and uh, uh, violent uh, trends in the country. Uh, so that again indicates how pressing the uh, special dimension of social justice is. And I would like to say, so far, it has not been addressed. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> uh, other indicators, uh, the difference in opportunities for health care, education, and employment. Uh, let's just take some uh, symptoms of that. Stunting uh, is, is about 25% of children aged 0 to 4 are stunted uh, with higher incidence, much higher incidence in Upper Egypt. Uh, that factors into many things uh, as life goes by. 20% of the people in uh, frontier governorates uh, have no access to improved water. And social mobility, I would like to underscore this. Social mobility in Egypt used to be high in the 60s, early 70s. Now it's almost grinded to a halt. Meaning that uh, the son of a judge will be a judge, the son of an officer will be an officer, the son of a university professor like myself will be an universal professor. I have no sons, so, uh, okay. Uh, factors behind, now, how do you explain uh, uh, this strong, I think, degree? It may not be as strong as in other countries, but with Egyptian yardstick, it is uh, strong. Okay, we, first we single out economic policy objectives, which said, okay, growth now, justice tomorrow. Okay, growth today, justice tomorrow. That's uh, a uh, reflection of the trickle-down theory, which never worked. Never worked in any society, and it did not work for Egypt. And, uh, you know, I remember an, an, an old Egyptian joke of uh, ordinary Egyptian who went to do some business with a government official, and he said, sir, uh, you told me to come back tomorrow. I was here yesterday and told you to come back tomorrow. He said, yes, but we are today. We are not tomorrow. So it means that tomorrow never comes. And uh, when you say social justice is going to, bo to, to be tomorrow, it never comes. Okay. By special and sectoral allocation of investment, just one example. The most important productive sector in Egypt in terms of employment, in terms of many things, exports and that, uh, is agriculture. And the share of agriculture in uh, investment fell down over the past 10 years from about 14% of total investment down to 3% of total investment. That means a glaring neglect of the agriculture sector and no wonder why Egypt is so food insecure. And we'll get to that point later. Okay. Again, the other factors is crony capitalism. You get an NDP, a National Democratic Party clique, heavily involved in dubious business uh, uh, deals, led to vast corruption that we still actually uh, <coughs> trying to cope with. Uh, put, putting businessmen in charge of cabinet portfolios, again, ignores the golden rule of conflict of interest. And that led to profiteering and uh, other things. Now, inflation is another factor behind injustice because it's like a regressive tax. And uh, for at least a decade, Egypt uh, had a two-digit uh, rate of inflation. Uh, and corruption induced privatization. The stories of privatization, what went there, uh, actually uh, uh, is very interesting, but uh, I'm not going to it. Now, okay, measures to be taken. I'll start by measures to be taken and then talk about measures taken so far. Measures to be taken, yeah. Five minutes. Okay. Well, the, in short, not much has been actually done to achieve the revolution slogan of bread, freedom, social justice. You may th some of you might think differently, but that's my judgment. Uh, the nearly daily protests are testimony uh, to the con uh, continuous absence of that. 
Okay. Now, measures to be taken. Uh, we have to answer questions like how best to address the issue of social justice, what options are available in the short run to expand a tight fiscal space. In fact, it's tight and it's growing tighter, unfortunately. And then what distributional instruments are possible and what trade-offs are necessary in order to achieve social justice. Okay. Also, <clears throat> uh, uh, in terms of the measures to be taken, uh, here's my approach, the approach that I'm actually promoting, and I hope I, I can make convincing argument for that. Uh, to address social justice, to target increasing aggregate supply. You know, the focus all the time has been to actually doing, juggling around with aggregate demand, increasing subsidies here, reducing subsidies there, hoping to reduce subsidy in total. But the, uh, there is neglect of aggregate supply. So the approach, I think, should be increasing aggregate supply. That can best be done through expanding food production. That, particularly in the case of Egypt, food is vital for national security and also for uh, pushing the consumer price index up. Uh, uh, when the food crisis erupted, that immediately translated into an increase in the cost of living because of rising food prices. That's going to continue to be. And if, you, if food is expensive and you are insecure, your labor force in terms of uh, regeneration of labor force, you will have a problem with that. So, Focusing on curbing aggregate demand, a la the IMF, leads to a zero-sum game. You have a zero. All social groups are quarreling with another, trying to snatch a bigger pie of uh, uh, bite of the pie, but the pie does not uh, change. So you have to work on that. Okay. So social justice is only partly about redistribution, but it takes much more. I want to uh, underscore this. In Egypt, giving priority to agriculture is the way to go. And uh, unfortunately, public discourse ignores the issue almost completely. Investing in the rehabilitation of covered uh, uh, drainage, sorry, drainage system and national grain storage is a must there. Now, as you know, when Egypt finished building the high dam in the early 70s, there was a big loan from the World Bank uh, for us to go and set up a national grid of covered irrigation uh, uh, drainage system that was in the mid second first half of the 70s of last century now it's almost uh, non-functional we need to rehabilitate that and if we do according to experts you can immediately increase agricultural productivity by something between 20 and 30 percent in one shot Factor that into the income of the farmers, the poorest uh, segments of the population. <coughs> and also you have to increase the uh, share of investment in agriculture, I mentioned before, fell to about 3% these days. Uh, the route is to subsidize producers uh, in a more effective way than subsidizing consumers. I know you have to run into some conflict with the WTO, but there are ways uh, around that. Uh, we can talk about in the discussion. Okay. Improving the incentive scheme uh, available for farmers is also key. Farmers' price response is really strong. And I actually experienced that when I was a minister. I advocated raising, uh, giving uh, farmers who produce wheat a price higher than the world uh, wheat price by something like 15 to 20%. And that worked miraculously. The, the increase was that. But then, uh, Measures do not stop there. We need institutional uh, change, and it's another vital element. How is that? If you take uh, the landlord-tenant relation in Egypt, it's really weird, because when the uh, law was amended back in 1992 through Law 96, it made the relation between uh, landlord and uh, tenant uh, subject to the rules of the civic code, meaning that every year or even every uh, agriculture season they had to sit together and agree on the terms of the contract that actually deprives farmers of uh, uh, security of tenants and in countries like france for example the uh, that contract lasts for nine years of course you don't freeze the rent the rent changes according to but but you have to right that's vital because 
the result would be to kill the uh, fertility of Egyptian land. And as we know, that's the most uh, valuable uh, item of wealth that we have so far. So we need to do something there. Okay, uh, particularly that the market in Egypt for land is a seller's market. You have so many people wanting to hire land and only few who are willing to it. Okay, introducing a genuine progressive tax system. That issue has been sidestepped most of the way. When the laws changed was to allow uh, a tax at the rate of 25 for those who uh, have a million and more. Uh, recently, the Minister of Finance uh, suggested that they're studying uh, introducing a tax at a rate of 5% on those with incomes uh, of a million uh, pounds or more. Uh, subjecting certain economic activities to taxes. For example, just this example. Imposing a tax on profits made through dealings in the stock exchange. The stock exchange in, in Egypt is a huge machine to plunge the country's resources. Why? Because uh, investment funds worldwide flock to the Egyptian stock exchange, buy uh, stocks at a price, and then immediately when the price rises to a limit, they just sell and fly away. They, they, they pressure the value of the Egyptian pound. They actually siphon off these resources outside the country, and uh, they cause a big strain on macroeconomic management and trying to preserve the, uh, the value of the pound. And that's for free. I mean, uh, Egypt is a panacea for investment funds to invest in. Just a few days ago, the, the main index on the stock exchange rose uh, to a record for the last six years, and there was no obvious reason for that at all. But it's the uh, dealings of those, okay? So that is important in order that the tax on capital gains also is important to and the speculative activities which are paramount. Okay, now what are the, the, fa the uh, <coughs> measures that have been taken so far? Well, setting a minimum wage. Initially it was 700 pounds a month, then lately it was raised to 1,200, applying to uh, public employees and there are negotiations of extending it to private uh, sector uh, employees. Progressive, tax, progressive taxation, but I, in my view, it's a timid uh, progressive scale. Equality of opportunity, access to basic services, health care, and education. A lot can be done there, especially with the new constitution, which has stipulated a minimum uh, proportion of GDP to be uh, allocated to this. Some sectoral uh, policy measures, and so the minimum wage there, and there's a cap, 30 to 1, uh, like maximum to minimum is uh, 30 to 1. Uh, it, it has not been implemented uh, completely, but uh, it's on the way. Okay. Now, prog progressive taxation, I did mention uh, that scale, and uh, it, it really is an area where uh, something has to, uh, to be done. Uh, equality of opportunity, two-thirds of the poor are in rural areas, in, in rural areas, particularly in Said, Upper Egypt. Upper Egypt is a very forgotten area, if you like, and uh, there is a glaring um, uh, urban bias there, bias uh, uh, towards urban against Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt, but significantly more in Upper Egypt. If I were to make the decision, I would declare Upper Egypt a special region in the jargon of the WTO, that allows me to actually go free out of the WTO restrictions in order to focus on that uh, risk. And then uh, we could uh, sensibly talk about uh, uh, equality of opportunity. Uh, until now, nothing was done, uh, and they flocked to the cities. And you can see when you uh, walk through even downtown Cairo, you'll see people who are peddling uh, many things including clothes. Okay, sectoral policy measures, uh, agriculture, I said, providing incentives, and just in one year, the, uh, uh, pr the ratio of subsidized bread, uh, local bread, uh, subsidized uh, baladi bread rose from 27%. That's the ratio of uh, local wheat in baladi bread. Baladi bread is the subsidized uh, loaf of bread 
The ratio of locally produced uh, wheat rose from 27 uh, to 33, it's a big jump, and then to 38 also, and I think the policy is still in place. Okay, the advantage of this policy are several. Uh, one, it relieves the pressure on the exchange rate because it reduces the need to import uh, wheat. Two, uh, it uh, actually uh, strengthens the country's food security, uh, as you know, by making it less reliant uh, on the outside uh, world. Number three, which is no less important, is that it immediately addresses poverty at the root by increasing uh, the income of farmers. And as we mentioned, two thirds of the poor are in rural areas, specifically farmers. So we want to do something about that there. <coughs> this, uh, this is actually a quick uh, run uh, through the main elements. But the point is that we should not have this strange fixation on uh, manipulating aggregate demand in order to uh, have a broader uh, fiscal space. The, the more intelligent way to broaden the social space and also address the issue of social justice is by paying attention to aggregate supply, incentives to producer rather than incentives to uh, consumer or alongside uh, to be designed. And, and that's the way to go. Now, the trouble with this is the following, is that in Egypt, and that's my final statement, in Egypt, the balance of political powers is not such as to bring us to this stage. The old powers are still well entrenched, and I, I fear that they're going to jump and uh, hijack the revolution for the third time. The second time revolution was hijacked by the uh, political uh, Islamists. Second time could be elements of the uh, National Democratic Party. And this is why I say we should actually expect these uh, policies to remain in place until a third wave uh, in on the road to revolution takes place. It's going to be very, very, very costly. Uh, in more than one way. And I hope we Egyptians will be wise enough to avert that. Thank you very much. And sorry if I have taken more time. Than